Greetings fellow students, my name is Ryan Thompson. I have prepared the following presentation to clarify a few points about the U.S. model of higher education and what exactly that means. Additionally, I shall be using this university, NC State, as the primary basis for the larger case study. I have titled the following presentation, The Commercialization of Campus, for a range of reasons. In particular, I would like to emphasize the role and overwhelming influence of off-campus actors in the U.S. higher education system. I in part hope to warn fellow students and scholars as to the final result of the larger reforms which are being promoted around the world as demonstrated by my university. There are numerous groups in the U.S. seeking to confront different issues within this larger systemic problem surrounding education. The group with which I personally affiliate are the Students for a Democratic Society. However, I speak only for myself and my personal experiences attending this university. Founded in 1887, NC State University is located in Raleigh, North Carolina. Over the years, the Brick Campus has become the largest in the state with nearly 40,000 students. The institution was founded as a land-grant college, commonly viewed as the People's University. Its early goals were to spread new agricultural techniques and the mechanical sciences. Early on, the university had a rich tradition in textiles and a heavy concern for rural parts of the state. The university was established as a part of the larger statewide system to be directed by the General Assembly. They in turn created the Board of Governors to oversee all 17 universities. Each campus was entrusted with a chancellor and corresponding board of trustees. I would like to mention that the state constitution proclaims that all education is to remain as free as possible. Cost aside, the larger tuition issue is directly tied to the state budget. Each and every year, predictable as the seasons, comes the crisis of education. In the era of austerity, education has been declared a private good and not worthy of state spending. The fiscal crisis of the state affects all levels of education on a reoccurring basis. Put simply, the government is currently caught between economic stagnation and training the workforce. As a result, education has become focused on coaxing the creation of capital to overcome this economic stagnation, and in doing so, has become a tool of the capitalist class. In many instances, Universities have been transformed into a corporate park, which simply realizes the interests of state and private actors. Let me put it this way. U.S. universities have literally become corporations, headed by an executive who encourages expansion and mass enrollment, in addition to annual fees and tuition hikes. Professors are placed on contingent appointments, meaning that they might not be hired back next semester and are not eligible for becoming full professors. Buildings and classrooms are named after corporations. Politicians and corporate representatives are in charge of selecting the board of trustees as well as the larger system-wide policies. In context, I mean to say that the Tea Party is currently governing our education system. Long before their rise to power, corporate partnerships were the primary focus for many universities. This means a new academic motivation to serve the highest bidder. The most recent being an NSA data analysis lab opening on campus. The Chancellor withheld this information for months while the Snowden leaks were in the media headlines. Another such incident is the sale of Hoffman Forest, a large piece of coastal property entrusted to the university. NC State has over 130 off-campus partners who contribute an immense amount of money to keeping the university running, especially as the school is prevented from obtaining adequate state funding. So let's talk numbers. This is a graph of NC State's undergraduate cost over the last 30 years Dark red is tuition and the lighter red are fees. As you can tell, costs have skyrocketed in a short period of time from under $1,000 to nearly $8,000 a year, and this is not including housing or food costs. Here are for grad students. Relatively similar, however, they remain lower for a longer period of time. As compared to out-of-state costs, well, if you're not from North Carolina, you're expected to pay more. An out-of-state undergrad is expected to pay about $20,000 a year, and the same goes for grad students. Many students take out loans or seek financial aid. Many graduate students obtain funding stipends. All that included, the average student from North Carolina in 2012 with a four-year bachelor's degree owes on average $20,800. Some are far higher and others are lower. Many of our parents take out multiple jobs and try to do their best to cover costs. I had a close friend become homeless because she refused to tell her parents she needed more money. These types of situations are not uncommon around campus. I will be brief with these two points. 
The Board of Governors, which oversees the UNC system, is appointed by state legislators and are heavily influenced by private companies, in particular, energy and military companies. The Tea Party Speaker of the House recently appointed new corporate representatives to oversee the universities. Additionally, the Board of Trustees is also comprised of similar individuals, my example being Gail Lanier here at NCSU. She has served as a trustee for nearly 12 years now and works for Duke Energy Company, the monopoly energy provider here in the southeastern U.S. Other companies on the board include Caterpillar Construction, who have been heavily involved in such things as the apartheid in Palestine. The campus has been drastically transformed from a neutral learning environment into a neoliberal space. Numerous lecture series and mass job fairs are run literally by the companies themselves. The military has heavy influence on campus and offers an alternative for those who cannot find funding otherwise. Most students are forced into debt to simply gain access to education. We must carry this context into the classroom. The millennial generation exists in debt, whether on our own or on our parents' dime. We are told to work harder in order to obtain credentials so we can be competitive on the job market. Student spaces are primarily covered by off-campus advertising for corporations and dance parties. As a result, the cultural capital of the university has been greatly depleted. Pride for the institution hangs on every street pole, thanking their long list of fiscal sponsors. The lecture halls are named after corporations. Other buildings are owned outright. The chancellor and trustees tell us to talk with student government, but they have no power. These individuals are traditionally aspiring bureaucrats seeking yet another credential. As a result, students have been forced to find alternative routes to influence those in power. Now, here in the States, we're taught at a very young age this kind of process of credentialism, and I want to expand upon it real quick. Uh, briefly put, it is, it is the idea that, oh, well, you have to not only get your elementary education, your secondary education, your higher ed education, but you're also trying to get all these things that you can ultimately put on a resume and outprove yourself in worth relative to somebody else. As a result, our competitiveness oftentimes takes this form of seeking new credentials, constantly looking for new ways to kind of build our resume, so to speak. To recap, the university now serves the function of capital. Research funding is often contingent upon locating a company to support you. Internships are yet another credential through which we exchange our free labor. By controlling the curriculum, capitalists maintain the ideal worker mentality as well as the larger liberal ideology. Recruitment is also a huge benefit for these actors. The workers pay for their own training and are often docile due to the overwhelming amounts of debt incurred in the process. Knowledge has become subject to the market. Science might very well have been compromised at a larger level. How can we determine what is truth if we do not take into account the conditions under which science takes place? Higher education in this context serves as a vehicle to perpetuate inequality through nepotism and the larger process of class discrimination. I will reserve discussing the NC student movement for another time. I will conclude with a comment that the U.S. model of education is something to be prevented before it institutes itself. Otherwise, it is like a virus that seizes the admin control and prevents its own uninstall. I believe that the best way to challenge this process of commercialization is to prevent it before the narrative of austerity is turned against the student. Be vocal in declaring education both a public good as well as a human right. I also encourage you to outright challenge the very idea that private influences have a place within the sciences. I assure you they do not, and it is a victory that can be won.